give it up with some amazing emojis for Katie from Moxie. Let me see those emojis in the chat. All right, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be muted and listening to you, and then uh, I'll see you on the other side for Q and A. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks also for putting me right after Alexis and Caitlin. So I may never forgive you, J. Cal, for that. <laughs> yeah, you're a celebrity too. You're a celebrity too. <laughs> um, no, but but seriously, I'm really proud. I'm really honored to be here today. And Jason and the Inside Team, thank you so much for having me. You guys have been um, friends and you've been allies and you've just done a great job, not just as investors, but as evidence here building community. So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to, um, in a very terrified state, meet so many of you online. Um, so my name is Katie Stanton. Um, I'm the founder and GP of Moxie Ventures. And throughout my career, I've always just loved working with trail trailblazers, people who are just creating new tools and services, people who are doing good in the world, and maybe most of all, people who are extending the ladder um, to others behind them to just leverage their talents and make the world better. So really grateful to be here today. Um, a couple of notes about um, Moxie and my background. Um, so it's myself and Alex Redder. Um, combined, we have about 20 years of experience in Silicon Valley. We met at Google, we were early at Google. He was an engineer and I was a product manager. We both coincidentally ended up at Google, at Twitter um, where I led international and then our media team and he led all of engineering. Um, so we've been working alongside of each other for the past 15 years as angel investors and as operators. We're both based in Boulder and going back and forth to San Francisco. We invest around the world, mostly uh, uh, North America, but we see opportunity everywhere. As Jason mentioned, um, I was recently in Miami. I've been on a tour of these great tech ecosystems. I was in Austin and then Nashville, Miami. After this, I'm flying to Chicago. So I'm super fired up to see all these different tech ecosystems emerge. And a little bit more, just double clicking on Alex and myself. Um, you know, we've worked at these companies for the past 20 years. We love building um, products and services and seeing them scale. Um, when I was at Twitter, I co-founded this group called Hashtag Angels, which is an investment collective of six women. We started it because we were really curious about angel investing. We wanted to become better investors. And then when we saw this huge gap between women on the cap table and men on the cap table, um, we thought, well, maybe that's a bigger mission for all of us. What can we do ourselves to help um, get more women on the cap table of these successful companies? And it was really that experience and that trusted network that turbocharged a lot of my interest uh, in, in, in angel investing and doing that full time today. I'm on two boards. I'm on the board with uh, one of Jason's besties, Chamath Palahapatiya. So I'm on the social capital iPod board. I chose that because I thought iPod would sound really cool, um, maybe better than IPOE. And I'm also on the board of Vivendi, which is an international um, multinational company based in Paris. Um, fun fact, it was started by Napoleon. So I feel like I have this really broad range of seed stage companies and one of the oldest companies in the world. And another fun fact, um, I was friends with Kanye West for one day and then um, now he doesn't like me anymore, but that's okay, we'll, we'll work it out one day. And I'm a wannabe J. Cal bestie. Um, and then Alex's uh, background here. So he's been an engineer throughout his career. Um, he's also been a mentor, an angel investor. Um, his fun fact, he was in The Social Dilemma and he is a pilot and he's actually the one flying us today. A little nervous, but there's another pilot um, to Chicago. So that's uh, pretty fun. So a little bit about our track record. Um, so we've been, both Alex and, and I have been angel investing over the past 10 years. And it took us a while to realize like, oh, we really love this. And we have this great network. Again, we love helping companies at the earliest of stages. So we've invested in roughly 75 companies. Um, they've done well. We've gotten, most of these companies have um, been uh, at the earliest of stages. I think something like 65% have been at seed. The rest have been in maybe A or B. Um, we're proud that uh, I think it's 35% um, of all of our combined investments have been female led, trying to get to at least 50, 50, um, but, um, but we're, we're, we're working on that. Um, and roughly 10% have been black led. Um, a little bit about our funds. So after angel investing for a while, decided I wanna start writing some big girl checks. So two years ago, I started Moxie um, uh, by myself. Alex was busy uh, helping to get electric cars flying at Kitty Hawk. So I raised $25 million. The goal has been 5% ownership, solo GP, and we've made 25 investments so far and we expect to be fully deployed next quarter. We're in the process of fundraising for fund two. 
We're raising 75 million. Um, our target ownership is about 10%. So just trying to climb up there with some of the other VCs that you're seeing. There'll be two of us and we expect to start deploying capital uh, later this year in Q4. So wanna call out a couple of our breakouts for Moxie Fund One that we're really proud of. Um, we invest across the board, everything that is software um, based. Daily was one of our earliest investments and we did that alongside the Freestyle team who you're lucky enough to see earlier today. We love co-investing with the Freestyle team. So Daily is an audio and video chat API tool, that de developer tool. So anyone can integrate that onto their website. Um, the second company that has seen a really great markup is Nearby, which is basically empowering uh, local businesses to be able to um, serve their, their local communities and, and compete a little bit against Amazon. Um, Super Peer, uh, my, uh, my one-liner was Super Peer, it's Cameo for the people. So everyone should have an easy way to share their skills, whether it's in cooking or design or gardening um, with, uh, with their fans. Um, and then Certain, which is a background check API, they're based in Victoria, Canada. That one has done really well. And then um, the big one is, uh, maybe this is a sore spot for JCal, but uh, Clubhouse um, uh, drop-in audio app, uh, which is doing really well. Super proud that Moxie, I think might be the only fund that was in the seed A, B, and C. All right, now the best part. How can we be helpful? And I know that's overused and people make fun of it. I haven't thought of a better way to say it. So we're just gonna add a little gift for it. Um, this is the best way. Um, and this is really the reason why we're in this business. We really love to help. Between Alex and I, we have a lot of experience building companies. Of course, Alex leading engineering teams, software engineering teams at a lot of companies, including Google and Twitter. Um, he's also worked in hardware, um, building electric flying cars at Kitty Hawk. I have, oops, ah technical difficulties, sorry about that. Um, I have a lot of experience in marketing, branding, and comms. I was a CMO at Color and then ran our comms team there as well. Um, we love helping our companies get to product market fit. Um, and so that takes a lot of different things, but one of the things that um, is, is often key is getting the right pricing. Um, so we do a lot of pricing workshops and talking about pipelines and customers and channel um, partnerships and so forth. Um, I used to work for President Obama in his first administration, so I have some experience in policy and regulation and um, somehow can get to if, if you're working in a startup that needs a little bit of policy help or regula regulation help. Um, we know uh, at least some people that we can talk to as sort of a first pass. Um, I mentioned go to market. Uh, influencers, having worked at Twitter, my job for a period of time was helping to get the world's best content creators onto the platform. So spent a lot of time working with all kinds of influencers across sports and music and talent and so forth. And recruiting, we see recruiting as the number one need for all of our founders. We have hired a part-time recruiter to help um, mostly with technical recruiting. So that's one area that um, specifically Alex has enormous experience with. So these are some of the ways that we like to you know, flex some of our experiences and help our founders avoid the avoidable challenges and be prepared for the things that aren't quite avoidable. And then of course, I mean, we love to be cheerleaders as good as Cal here. I don't know if we're as good at dancers, but we will always like raise some hands for our founders and do whatever um, it takes to help our founders win. Okay, um, and then some very specific examples. So Clubhouse, I just became so obsessed with. A friend of mine had texted me the, um, the test flight when they originally launched in March of last year. And it was tremendous founders at this crazy time um, that had a really great product. And it just checked a lot of the boxes that we typically look for. And so the way that Moxie tried to be helpful was leveraging influencers. What, who are the best you know, content creators that would do really well on this platform? Um, we tried to give them you know, some of the advice that we had learned um, early at Twitter. What were the big mistakes we made at Twitter? And don't do those again. So, um, so we talked about on press and marketing and trust and safety. We did some branding workshops with the team. And then we spent a lot of time trying to recruit um, just tremendous candidates. And um, they're off to the races. I mean, I don't think any of us have seen a company grow this quickly and so elegantly. I think that there are gonna be a lot of case studies about what Paul and Rohan did right. Um, and so really bullish and really excited about what the team at Clubhouse is building. And then another example is with Daily. So Daily, again, tremendous founders building a really important product at the right time. 
as everything went to remote, if it were work or education, telemedicine and, and, and so forth, um, this was an opportunity for this amazing team to grow and scale. So we spent a lot of time with the team helping to advise on a lot of similar things, press and marketing and recruiting. We spent a lot of time on go to market and a lot of introductions to potential enterprise uh, customers and really excited to see this team grow. I think I get even most excited when I see these brilliant founders who are just really kind people and, um, and just building a lot of good in the world, good in the marketplace, good at the company level. Um, and lastly, these are some examples from the angel investments that we've made. So, you know, from time to time, we like to bring influencers where it makes sense um, onto the cap table. So with Color, we helped recruit Bono because he had been a big advocate for public health and also, um, you know, in cancer in the early days of Color. Modern Fertility, which had a great exit um, a couple of weeks ago. We were one of their first checks, really excited to back this badass lady team, um, making it more uh, accessible for women to understand their fertility and manage that. So we spent a lot of time in the early days with other, um, you know, bringing in an all-star cap table, bringing on key talent and advising them on PR. And then this is the most random example, but I felt like I had to throw it in as you're meeting with lots of VCs. Here's, you know, one random differentiator. Um, when I was at Twitter, our team had helped onboard the Pope and the Vatican um, onto Twitter. So I had this relationship and one of my early, earliest investments was in Prey.com, arguably the oldest social network in the world. And um, we introduced the, the Prey founders to the Vatican and the Vatican was so excited. So they invited the Prey team over for the first ever hackathon at the Vatican. And so that was really cool. My um, very Catholic grandmother, rest in peace, she would have been very proud of that. And um, we also helped connect the team to President Biden um, so uh, President Biden could do uh, the National Day of Prayer on a pray.com Spotify station. So that was pretty fun. Okay, um, where we invest. I think this is the part you're like, blah, 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 Katie, move on. <laughs> like, what, what do you actually do? Um, so with Moxie, both fund one and fund two, um, we invest in anything before the A. We love seed. I would say we're a real classic seed um, investor. Pre-seed, um, we don't do as much in, um, where it's just an idea. We really like to see some tinkering with the product. Um, we are open-minded by any kind of category fueled by software, but I would say our sectors of strength are consumer, enterprise, fintech, health tech, and we're spending a lot of time in climate. Arguably, it's the most important problem that needs to be solved for all of us. So within climate, um, we look for products that have at least a very strong software component. There is market demand. It isn't really a science project that the, it's proven um, and also something that's really going to make a, an impact. Um, we don't necessarily, we don't wait on pedigree. Um, so we really look at the potential of our founders and their determination. This is, this is hard. And so um, it's important to be that, to be in this um, position for the right reasons. And this should be all of our life's work. Um, we look for ideas that have the potential to be a category creator and or a leader. Um, we always have sort of a lens for world positive. Um, is this going to do good in the world? Um, if it's gonna do, you know, potential to do harm, we try to uh, not do those. <laughs> and um, our check sizes range for fund one, I'd say our median check size was close to about um, 250K. And, um, but going forward, we're going to um, have more money um, to write bigger checks and have more ownership. So we're gonna um, start to graduate up to about one and a half million. Um, we have led 20% of the deals in fund one. Um, we hope to lead maybe half the deals in fund two, but we are real collaborators. Um, part of the reason why we love investing at Seed is that there's so much collaboration around the table, and we think that's really good for founders. Um, we're not there to block out and block and tackle other investors in there because there's so many smart ones, so many great ones, and you're hearing from all of them today. Jason knows everybody, so that's great. Um, and I wouldn't say we're awesome at this yet because so to date it's just been me and we're gonna double with Alex, um, but our goal is to try to get decisions within a week. Um, so that is our OKR to um, get founders decisions quickly, expeditiously um, and carefully and part of our process, um, we you know, will talk to both founders, if there are two or more, um, we will try to talk to customers, we will try to you know, really play with the product. Um, Alex probably submits more uh, bug tickets than any other VC, <laughs> so be forewarned, but we think it's helpful. And, um, and, uh, and that's how we roll. So how to contact us, uh, katie at moxie.vc and alex at moxie.vc, please follow us on Twitter. And a big thank you to the launch team. Again, we're big fans. Oh. 
And I want to give a big shout out to Heidi. I don't know if she's listening today, but fun, like this is random. You can tell someone's character when like when no one else is looking. And in the early days of the pandemic on Twitter, I never met Heidi from Jason's team. And I tweeted something about looking for hand sanitizer. We know how manic that period of time was. And Heidi out of the blue just FedEx me like a bunch of hand sanitizer. And it's something I'm gonna remember the rest of my life. I'm forever grateful to Heidi. I love the launch team, the inside team. And uh, thank you again for having me. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> And uh, Katie, that's a fantastic presentation as well. Pretty great. Heidi's pretty great. I don't. I think she's probably busy working on a bunch of syndicate <laughs> deals right now. We are just so crazy busy uh, like you are. Uh, what a great uh, discussion. One week to get an answer from when you meet with the company to, uh, I guess, doing diligence. Pretty hard to do uh, diligence in that short period of time. H how do you make that happen? I mean, it just sounds super super challenging, or is that from when diligence is completed maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's just, again, it's an OKR goal because yeah. I hear from founders over and over again. And often, as we all know, like it's so crowded out there and everyone wants an answer right away. And it's tough. I don't know, for those of you in the room, you know, who haven't raised as a fund manager, it's really interesting for us fund managers. We're in between these ocean liners of LPs who take months and months and months to make a decision. And these little speedboats of founders who just needed an answer within a week. And so we're trying to, you know, balance that. So, you know, it is always our goal to try to just be as quick and as thorough as responsive. We don't always meet that goal. I would say like, we're probably trending like two weeks, but we're trying to move a lot faster because we know it's important to founders. Yeah, not easy. Let's take some questions, Michael. Uh, I don't want to monopolize the question. Yeah, so my first question is, how can I meet Bono? I'm like, he's <laughs> my favorite, is my favorite band. He is so nice. He really, I, so this is the fun uh, random story. So when we were opening up Twitter internationally, um, obviously, you know, most of the companies are based in Dublin, but we were getting recruited to be based in the Netherlands or the UK and the Irish government was trying really hard to get us there. And I had just kind of casually thrown out there like, well, maybe if we meet with Bono, um, you know, be able to make our decision. And they're like, oh no, you know, Bono doesn't make these decisions. We're like, all right, well, just maybe. And then one day they're like, if you can get to Bono's pub in the next 10 minutes, he will meet with you. And I was like, oh my God. So we went to the pub, spent a couple hours there. He was really, really nice. Loves to invest, loves to be helpful. Like he's just a really like A plus guy. That's amazing. I, I, yeah, I got to meet, I got to meet him once in Dublin when I saw him live a couple of years ago, but okay. So speaking to that Dublin, the Irish government, and also your background on policy, wh where are your thoughts on GovTech, your investments on GovTech? Where, where's that space headed and do you invest in GovTech? Great question. I actually, I've seen a few GovTech companies. I would love to see more. So if you're a founder building this, I do think we need to build, you know, more tools and services um, to help our government function at the local level, the state level and the federal level. Um, it's why I joined the Obama administration a number of years ago. You know, we need to use the tools of the 21st century to address the challenges of the 21st century. So um, I haven't invested in anything to date, though. So open-minded. Okay, and then following that up really quickly with another sector-specific question: What are your thoughts on ed tech post-COVID boom? Where are you where are you where are you leading that way? I love it. Um, I've seen some. It's a new category for me. Um, the only ed tech company I've done personally has been Lambda School. And that's been really interesting. I think that, you know, area is right for, you know, doctor, I have three kids in college and I think it's kind of a waste to be honest. And so definitely open to, you know, more modern ways to teach our, you know, our, our you know, K through 12 and onwards um, to make education more affordable, more practical, um, more useful. Okay, so I, those were those were both questions from the audience. I have one more question from the audience here. How would you define product market fit, specifically when it comes to if you if you typically don't invest pre-seed, right? You you want to see something. I think you said a product that somebody's tinkering with. How would you define product market fit, and what level of product market fit do you have to see before you're like writing the check? Yeah, I'd say it really depends on the category. I look for relentless. Um, uh, attention to customers. So understanding the customers, how long is the sales cycle, retention, growth. For enterprise, it will take a lot longer, obviously, but for consumer products, it can be quite quickly. So, you know, Clubhouse is, you know, a ridiculous example because they just grew so fast um, and they had product market fit seemingly instantly. But 
that's not normal. Um, you know, they're good and they're also, you know, a bit lucky, like just great timing and product and everything at the right time. So, you know, look at a lot of different KPIs, but it is somewhat specific to the actual vertical. Yeah, how do you deal with the, um, Katie, the high pressure, high valuation market we're living in? It seems like sometimes founders have so much interest. They're asking, uh, not dissimilar to people buying homes without doing an inspection or, you know, multiple bidders. It seems like the discipline that uh, existed in investing has just been totally removed for maybe half of investors. So does that concern you at all? I know this is kind of a meta question, not a founder question, but I think it's an important one since founders and, and investors are in business together for decades that people aren't even doing the basic house inspection or diligence, not even reading the documents, just signing anything and shipping money. Uh, feels a little bit concerning to me. Does it feel concerning to you? And how are you, are you changing your behavior at all because of this manicness? Great question. I mean, it does concern me. And it's so funny you asked this today because Greg and I just submitted an offer on a house <laughs> here in Boulder finally. And um, so nice. Nicole will appreciate that too. I've been bugging her about housing in Boulder. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we have to be disciplined. I mean, we're in this business for a long time. It takes a long time to build these things. So you have to get these things right at the get-go. And I look back at, you know, Katie Stanton two years ago when I was pitching LPs and I said, I'm going to be very disciplined. I'm going to look for companies less than $10 million valuation. And man, was that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. I mean, and ironically enough, the only company, actually there have been two companies in my portfolio that had a $10 million valuation. One was Clubhouse. And now <laughs> I love using that example because I can go back to founders. Like you really don't have to have a 20, $30 million valuation for a pre-product market fit because like, A, that's a steeper hill to climb later. And B, when you're in this very competitive market, trying to get the world's best engineers and designers and marketers to join early, you know, if all things being equal, this is price per share here and this is price per share there. Like, that's just another hurdle you're gonna have to like, you know, fight. So, mm -hmm. um, so I am concerned. Um, I've tried to stay as disciplined as possible. I think the median valuation that we've invested in now for Moxy One is 15. So not terrible, um, but higher than I expected. But then at the same time, the most important, like we wanna get into the best deals. And right. so, you know, I would feel like a dummy if I said, Oh, Clubhouse is priced too high at yeah. 10 million. I only do 5 million. So never mind. Like right. I would look like the biggest idiot. So it is a balance. It's an art, you know, versus a science. And I try to approach it every single deal differently. And when it's priced just so high, my conviction just better be, you know, better match that, that height. So you mentioned the hurdle. For founders. And I think this is really important because when an investor says, don't raise too high of the valuation, it seems like we're, we're saying that because we don't want to pay a high price for the share. But there is a reality here. If somebody pre-product market fit, pre-revenue raises, let's just pick a number here at $25 million post, and they raise $4 million at $25 million post, they get down to $500,000 in you know, cash in the bank. They got six months of runway and they don't have product market fit or they have light product market fit, what happens to a company like that historically? Yeah, they have to raise more money. Maybe it's a down round, maybe it's a seed extension. The seed extent or whatever extension it is, like yeah. it used to have a bad name, but now, now it's so funny. Now people are calling it like a pre-series A. <laughs> the marketers and yeah. venture are hilarious. Framing um, it is critically <laughs> important. <laughs> Yeah, that's, like very opera, that's very optimistic. This isn't an extension. This is a pre-up round. <laughs> yeah, it's a pre-up round. So come in early. So it is, it's really funny, but I, I, it's dangerous. You don't want to run out of money. You don't want to feel desperate. You always want to raise capital from a position of strength mm -hmm. and you know, where you have choices and where you have data that supports that valuation. And so you know, I've seen a lot of founders, the best founders that I've worked with, have just been, you know, data driven, methodical, unemotional about, mm. you know, like they're not trying to prove, oh, well, my other friend just raised however much from Sequoia at this valuation. So I need to <laughs> reset. They're unemotional about it. They have enough confidence in themselves and and have their eyes on a bigger prize, which is, you know, going public. Um, in fact, one of my favorite founders, um, I can share his name here. His name is Marco from Plus Plus. 
Uh, he writes, I've seen, we've all seen thousands of these investor updates and they have a little rhythm to them, but there was something about the first investor update that I received from Marco. And it was such a great investor update. He raised at a reasonable round. This is a third company, very seasoned uh, founder. And when I told him, Marco, this is the best investor update I've ever seen. And he just replied, you know, nonchalantly, Katie, I intend to be a public company. So I might as well get my training wheels on now. And this is how we're going to build this company. And just so clear, so, you know, um, such a big vision. And those are the founders that I get really fired up about. Yeah. And if they are, if you're confident that you can make the money last and you can hit product market fit, less of less danger in raising at that high valuation. But boy, if you don't hit product market fit and then the valuation has to go back down to 10 or 15 or warrants get involved or other devices, it just can start this death spiral where the whole company just feels like it's perpetually spiraling down as opposed to spiraling up. And you went from, a, you know, $2 million on a 12 post to a $3 million on an 18 post, whatever it is, $18 million cap, that feels better to the market. And I, I know it's op just optics, but boy, it's a real um, issue. Any more questions, Mike, from the audience? Uh, have you made any AR, VR investments? And then the last question that I'll ask you is, what's the best way for prospective founders to get in touch with you? Yeah, I had initially dismissed AR, VR because I just get dizzy, <laughs> to be totally honest. But um, um, Elad Gill had incubated a company called Moonwalk um, or Pluto. And my rule of thumb with investing, if Elad touches it, I'm in. He is just one of the most brilliant operators, founders, investors. And I know we've been great friends for the past 15 years. We worked at Google, Twitter, and Color together, and he's just phenomenal. So when he was building it and he brought on an engineer that worked for that Color that I'm a big fan of. Um, so I, 100%, how much can I get? I'm in. Um, so that's the only one. Um, to get in touch, katie at moxie.bc um, with two X's for the female chromosome. And, um, and also please follow us at Moxie Ventures on Twitter. If you want to support events like this and, and keep them going in the future, thanking the sponsors on Twitter, what an amazing thing to do. You can at Jason, me at Inside and thank our amazing partners who made this possible. Really want you to um, give some love and attention, maybe retweet or thank the sponsors. You paid zero dollars to come today. You know why? All this work and effort because of sponsors like Just Call, ClearCo, Electric, and Burn Rate. Really, really, really appreciate the sponsors who helped me pay for my team to do all this work. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you all. My name is Will Evans. I am the director of sales at Electric. And today I wanted to talk to you all about a really exciting topic. I say that sarcastically. Um, IT. So we're going to talk about IT, which, which probably is top of mind for, for a lot of people here, especially given all the news recently around ransomware attacks and IT security. So we will touch on a lot of that stuff today as well. Um, so I'm trying to save 10 minutes at the end for Q&A and, and we'll dive in. So I think we all know that people are what power your business and technology is what powers your people. I don't think anyone's denying that, especially in the cloud Ford world that we're living in, um, where, where technology is really what allows our teams to be productive and our businesses to succeed. But historically, IT, especially for SMBs and startup companies can, can be overwhelming, disparate, siloed, and confusing. There's also a lot of pieces of IT to consider from how do we support our end users to how is our inventory being managed to how are we evolving our tech stack to make sure our team can be productive and we have a competitive advantage and especially around security as well. Um, so there's a, a lot to consider when thinking about IT and in your IT strategy. The question that you all as founders and entrepreneurs need to be asking is, how can you make sure your bases are covered? So we're gonna go through three questions that every single small, medium-sized business executive should be asking themselves. And if they aren't after today, hopefully you will. 
And then we'll talk a little bit about the landscape and how you can get to uh, you know, having your bases covered. And also we'll talk a little bit about electric. So the first question that, that's probably top of mind for everyone is, are you at risk of a data breach? It's all over the news. We're seeing it happen. All of these cyber attacks, it's pretty crazy. Um, but, but the good news is you can protect yourself. A couple of stats just to review is that if there is a data breach, one in four customers won't continue to work, work with companies. 60% of small businesses will close forever after a data breach. And 71% of organizations have had employees succumb to a social engineering attack since the pandemic started, which really, quite frankly, has just exacerbated the vulnerabilities um, that were present when we were in an office, but maybe not as exploitable uh, by bad actors. So there are solutions out there. Um, the first one you're going to want to consider is, are your endpoints, are the devices that your employees are using to work secure? Do they have disk encryption set up? Are there complex passwords on them? Um, do they have screen dimming timeout set up? Are USB ports blocked? Secondly, you're going to want to look at the applications that your team is using to power their work. Think Google, Microsoft, Slack, Salesforce, whatever it might be, HubSpot. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that multi-factor authentication is deployed across all of those applications. And lastly, or not lastly, third, third point here is implement a VPN. There are virtual VPNs that you can roll out, um, one that Electric has partnered with that is, is really blowing up and, and doing great is Perimeter 81. Um, and that won't require a native firewall or an office network. It, it's all virtual. So it's an option available to you whether or not you have an office. And then lastly, just make sure your teams are educated about cybersecurity and, and aware of the risks that uh, are present in, in this hybrid work environment we're, we're all participating in. Now, the second question, since we're all probably gonna be hiring a lot if things go well, is how is the onboarding experience for a new employee? Are your new hires able to be successful from day one and, and do their job? If they're not, an employee is two times as likely to look for another opportunity. But if they are, they're going to be around for a long time. 69% of employees are more likely to stay at an employer for three years if they have a great onboarding experience. So how do we make sure this happens? Ideally, you're using a zero touch onboarding solution to streamline and automate the IT components of onboarding. This will ensure that from day one, your employees are set up for success with the device that they're going to use, the hardware that they need that's ancillary to that device, and all of their applications are set up in a secure manner. Question three, is IT the best use of my team's time? We, we work with SMBs at Electric and what I can tell you leading the sales team is the number of CEOs and CTOs and founders, COOs, uh, that we're working with who are handling IT, even though obviously it's not their job, is tremendous. And it, it likely is a pretty big burden. Um, of course, large enterprises are going to have a lot more funding and resources to adopt emerging technologies like IT automation, VR, 5G, you name it. Um, in fact, they're, they're going to have five times as much funding to do that over the next two years. However, that doesn't mean SMBs can't be evolving their IT infrastructure and support as well. So the solution is don't spend time on it. We call, we call uh, the environment, the IT environment where someone's doing IT, but it's not their job, a de facto environment. Um, and that means, again, it's, it's someone who's, whose job it is not to handle IT, doing things like set, resetting passwords, fixing computers, troubleshooting, employee on and offboarding. 
And really the answer is you can outsource it and not break the bank. And that's what we'll talk about a little bit here. So just to recap, three questions you wanna think about as, as executives, as founders, as entrepreneurs. Am I at risk of a data breach? Is the onboarding process for new employees one that is enjoyable and leads to productivity? And lastly, is IT support impacting my team's productivity and thus achieving our overarching business objectives? Is it getting in the way? Is it bogging you down? So when we think about IT at Electric, and I think anywhere, quite frankly, you really have three options. You could build a team internally. You could outsource to a traditional managed service provider, or you could look at a firm like Electric, who's really trying to disrupt the traditional managed service model by bringing technology and software to the table, but also taking the best parts of an outsource model, the strategy, the project work, the evolution of our customer's tech stack and applying it to a modern approach to IT. So we'll go through these three options and then we'll talk a little bit about electric. The first one is building a team internally. The challenge with that is it's really a linear progression. If if you want to be impactful with an internal IT team, you're going to want to have a ratio of one IT professional to 60 full-time employees. Of course, that IT person is going to be limited in their specific expertise. We like to say like you, you could find a unicorn in the sense that someone can do everything and knows every single software out there and all of the you know, cloud providers and, and infrastructure components that, that are important, but that, that's tough, tough to find. And then lastly, if you do have one person, it's gonna be, their bandwidth is gonna be strapped. And, and pretty soon, if, if we're all successful and, and revenue's going well and we're growing, you're gonna to need to hire more. The second option is to go with a traditional managed service provider. We'll talk a little bit more about these, these types of businesses shortly here, but a few of the challenges that this presents is they're not gonna bring the, the modern security tools to the table, MDM, which is a acronym for mobile device management. Quite frankly, it's a little bit of a misnomer. We're not talking about cell phones, we're talking about laptops and tablets when we talk about MDM, but most MSPs are not gonna offer something from a security standpoint that makes sure your endpoints are secure. 40% of traditional managed service providers have less than 10 people on their team, which means number one, that there's limited expertise, but number two, it means that when your firm gets to a point, you know, call it 50 people, that's not gonna scale with that managed service provider. And, and the last thing you're gonna to wanna to do is have to change out who's handling your IT. Some of the other challenges we hear from the market around traditional managed service providers are ineffective and poor quality support. Talking about really long response times, slow resolution times, and extremely limited visibility into what they're actually doing for your business. Next, Traditional MSPs, quite frankly, just aren't adapting to the times because they haven't had to. There hasn't been a disruptor in their space that's making them think, am I really providing the best customer experience? Am I meeting my customers where they live in Slack or Microsoft Teams? And am I able to provide them the guidance to evolve their tech stack with the times? And what we hear from the market is, is most don't. And then lastly, ambiguous pricing models. Um, the number of times I've heard customers coming to electric and saying, we're getting charged for things I have no idea what they're doing is, is pretty astounding. Um, so now we'll go into the better way with electric. So first of all, who is electric? The way I like to think about electric is we are a modern managed service provider. Um, 
we have funding from tier one investors. We raised about a hundred million dollars to date. Our last round was a, a forty-five million dollar Series C led by Greenspring, and a bunch of our our former investors. I know GGV is a panel member here, so they were they were a part of our early round. And Electric has also partnered with best in breed technology providers. We're bringing one hundred and thirty. IT technicians and engineers to our customers. And we have over 400 customers at that at this point with 25,000 end users under our support model. And the reason I say we like to think of electric as a modern managed service provider is again, we're taking the best parts of the old model, which are boots on the ground, being able to deliver on site strategic work and project-based work to help evolve your business, coupled with a platform that is designed to make IT very transparent and incredibly fast and easy for our customers. So we've built our product on top of Slack and Microsoft Teams, as well as our own web application where our customers get visibility into their entire IT infrastructure can manage um, IT on their own from a visibility standpoint and also submit on and offboarding requests. The three core pillars of electric support are gonna be real-time support. So what we're doing is we built an application that lives in Slack and Microsoft Teams. And behind that application, we have 130 plus IT specialists that are able to resolve your employees issues really quickly and we guarantee a response time of 10 minutes or less the second piece of electric's value prop is going to be security we think about security on the device the application and the network level and what we're going to do is deploy best in breed tools to make sure your team is secure and your devices are secure as well as make recommendations around how do we get help our customers get to SOC 2 certification, ISO 27001. Uh, many of our customers are HIPAA regulated. So based on your requirements, we're gonna make recommendations um, that are gonna match your business needs. And then the last piece for electric is gonna be automated on and offboarding. You submit a request in a few clicks, we take care of the rest and we'll dive a little bit deeper into all of these in a second here. This is just a quick visualization of how, how Electric thinks about the workflow. So your team supported via Microsoft Teams or Slack. We're gonna handle all of their IT issues through there. And if, and if needed, we'll get on a, a screen share um, or a call. As the administrator of Electric, you're gonna have full visibility in our backend web portal, which is called Turbine where we're gonna provide you insights into how your business is, is operating from a security standpoint, and then also visibility into what are the tickets that are coming through to the electric help desk? What are the categories? How's our team interacting? CSAT score, time to resolution, but more importantly, where are the bottlenecks caused by old technology in, in our user base? Where do we wanna make strategic investments to improve our tech stack so that we don't run into these issues anymore. It would be great if Electric's customers didn't have any IT issues because that means we've done our job from a strategy standpoint. A huge piece of this is gonna be the visibility. So really giving your team a single pane of glass view into your overall IT environment. And what's our secret weapon besides the technology that we've built? It's our expertise. Once you're live with electric, you're gonna be supported by, again, the 130 plus IT professionals with that guaranteed 10 minutes or less response time. And we're managing over 800 tickets a day and processing 4,000 on and off boardings a month, which is pretty, pretty amazing to hear. Of course, we also have a strategic projects division that's helping our, our customers evolve their tech stack as well. Um, and we're doing about 150 projects a month there too. So when we think about the real-time support, 
the real key here is enabling and empowering your employees to get support when they need it so they can be productive. Again, hitting on that 10 minute response time. And, and what we're really proud of beyond the response time is resolving tickets in about one third of the time of a traditional managed service provider. Our customers are gonna lean on us for stuff as simple as a password reset, all the way to my device stopped working, I need a new one in the next hour, what are we gonna do? Um, and everything in between that, in, including server management and network management. We support over 150 applications here at Electric. So we, we do have that broad expertise. Um, many of our customers are you know, very much cloud forward and, and using a lot of web applications. So you know, that, that's where we've um, invested in our expertise and, and brought in in-house experts from Apple, Microsoft, Google, um, the, the Genius Bar at Apple and the Geek Squad at Best Buy. That, that's what our team is made up of as well as um, SaaS experts with experience in um, managing SaaS applications and, and troubleshooting them across the board. So now let's touch on the remote device management piece. And this is a part of electric subscription. We're gonna deploy and manage the remote device management on your behalf using Kaseya for Microsoft or, or Windows OS devices and Jamf Pro, a best in breed product as well for our Mac OS devices. This product allows us to do four things primarily. The first one is to give our customers visibility into your device inventory. So making sure that your devices, if unused, are, are, you're aware of them and we're able to deploy those to new hires or, or hot fixes if someone's device breaks. The second one is going to be device health. So understanding when are we gonna to need to replace this device? What does our RAM, disk space, CPU usage look like? Most importantly, security. So our team of MDM engineers is gonna manage these programs on your behalf. And we're gonna standardize the security policies across your entire fleet. And lastly, provisioning and deprovisioning. So without being physically with the device, we're able to remotely wipe and set up devices for our customers, which unlocks a lot of this remote IT support. Security wise, just a few of the things that we're, we're recommending to our customers and standardizing on, password policies, disk encryption, firewall configuration, antivirus management, patch management for operating systems and, and applications that have vulnerabilities, and of course, the ability to, to remotely wipe a device if it's ever lost or someone gets fired and, and they need, you need that device locked immediately. So the last piece product-wise that we're gonna to touch on here is on and offboarding. Um, so in our web application, our users are able to, in, in a matter of clicks and, and minutes, literally three minutes is, is the average time it takes, submit a request for an on and offboarding and then from there, you're gonna be able to track the progress. Our team is gonna do everything from ordering you the new device or repurposing an old device to setting up all of the applications that that specific person is gonna need um, based on their role and department, which, which is also a piece of this where we're creating profiles based on which department and which role they're entering. So all you need to do is tell us what role they're going to be during on this onboarding um, submission workflow, we're gonna pre-pull in all of their applications and all of the hardware that that specific role and department's going to get. So in sum, why electric? The day-to-day -day support, um, you know, just really quickly, we were doing remote support way before the pandemic. We've been around for four and a half years. All the pandemic did was accelerate a trend that we knew was going to happen, which is this hybrid work model. So um, we didn't pivot. This is what we've been doing. It has been a boon, thankfully for us, but we're experts in, in remote IT support. Security wise, deploying the MDM, multi-factor authentication, making sure that you're not at risk for a data breach, the automated on and offboarding, and lastly, any strategic projects that you need, whether that's rolling out Okta, migrating you from an on-premises server, which I imagine no one no one in here is using to the cloud or um, whether that's consolidating domains from an email perspective 
or rolling out a VPN, we got the team here to do it. And if you need boots on the ground at your office for a build out, we have partners around the country in our major markets that are going to be able to, to facilitate that on-site work and, and we'll coordinate everything. So reminder, you have three options when it comes to building out your IT function. Build an IT team internally, outsource to a traditional managed service provider, or go with electric. So we are the solution, we believe, for SMBs. We don't touch enterprise. We barely touch lower mid-market. Any, any folks on the line that are 20 to 500 full-time employees in the U.S. that are using Slack or Microsoft Teams and Google or 365 for email and you need help with IT, we would love to have a conversation with you. And in fact, if you do want to have that conversation and you fall into those um, prerequisites for us to be able to work together, we're going to hook you up with a pair of Beats headphones. So feel free to um, reach out to us at hello at electric.ai and we'll make sure that we get you the Beats headphones. You're also going to be getting an email from us with that same offer. But if you want to get ahead of it, feel free to reach out directly.